I want to first of all take the opportunity tonight as we begin this Wednesday night service. It's about, uh, actually, the, the time of the message is how we can recognize Christian maturity. Uh-oh. But we want to take the opportunity to those that are viewing us live tonight on the web. Thank you for tuning in to our service. And no matter where you are, and I understand if, and, and I, if I'm correct, no matter where you are all over the world, you can plug in. So we've had people from different countries uh, tuning in our service. So we want to thank you. Um, if you live in the United States, <laughs> we'd like for you to come join us at Highest Praise Tabernacle. We firmly believe, and I believe as you see as we teach and preach, that we believe in what God's Word says, and we believe in teaching it and applying it to our, our lives. And I believe that the church is here to um, ba basically equip the saints to go out and do battle in the world. So we want to invite you to come join us if you're in the area. We'd love to have you. Amen? Amen. Uh, how can you recognize a mature Christian, Christian maturity? <laughs> I know that's a, a difficult question to ask, answer sometimes. So what makes Christianity different in this world? Because first, first of all, I want you to just look at this before I go in Ephesians. And you can turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. But the Christian life begins with the spiritual birth. Do we agree? You've got to accept Jesus Christ, and there's a spiritual birth that takes place. It's not a ceremony. It's the new birth that takes place when you receive Christ as Savior. So when you're, um, when you're uh, um, born again, when you're um, a babe in Christ, you're kind of immature, right? Aren't we immature? Do some people ever grow up? Well, I, that's what we've got to look at because, see, we've got to understand that um, that new birth takes place uh, and, and what has to happen in that new birth. And how many of you would like to mature as a Christian? If you don't, I'm going to go on and say you'll stay in the crib. You'll stay on the milk bottle. And you'll wonder why God never uses you. God's not going to send you into something you're not equipped to handle. And I want you to know, I want to be equipped to handle because we run into all sorts of stuff and where the Christians messing up, we don't know how to handle the situations we're in. So now we have God's plan, birth, growth, and maturity. Um, I want us to look at the, the indications of infancy in the, um, the new birth. As, as, as when we see people that are, are new born again believers, uh, a lot of times you can tell because a lot of the new Christians supposed to be new, or more concerned with self than service. Okay? That's a, that's a mark of what we call immaturity. Is that the right word? Okay. Also, too, more concerned with argument than action. Have you ever met people that just will complain, complain about everything you're doing but won't do nothing to help you? <laughs> that's a whole service all by itself. Let's, let's just keep right on rolling. And, and another sign of, of, of infancy or, uh, is looking to man rather than to God. See, we need to understand as we mature as Christians, how can we recognize that Christian maturity? Well, first of all, we need to understand what the Bible says. And, and as, as you follow along in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 through 16, I'd like for you to follow along with me as I read. But unto every one of us is given... Grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now in parenthesis in chapter 9, now that, I mean verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Now, while we're on verse 12, I'm just going to say that again because that's going to be so important. For perfecting of the saints. That means to 
to lead somebody into uh, growing, maturing, right? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Who's the body of Christ? Okay. Now he says in verse 13, Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, that we henceforth be no more children. Everybody say children. Tossed to and fro, and cared about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of man, and cunning craftiness, whereby ye lie in wait to deceive. Now, 15 says, But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, there's one more verse of Scripture, but listen to what I said in verse 15, because we're talking about growing, right? But speaking the truth in love, may what? Grow. Everybody needs to be growing. Grow up. How many times you looked at your child and said, grow up? I hope they ain't on this live television. But I've, 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 I know some people in their 60s, grow up. I tell them they ain't never going to grow up. Grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, verse 16 says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which ever jo every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Can I break this down to old country boys' terms? Because I know some of you are going, what does that mean? It means that the church is supposed to be growing together, and people are supposed to be working together. We're supposed to finally get unity and join together and work together as one. Okay, that's, that's just my version, my simple version. So I want to ask you a question. The question of it is, how can we recognize that we are matured or, or recognize Christian maturity, as I so put it? Well, first of all, the mature Christian is a believer with a mission. Verse 11 and 12, as we just read, talked about this. Perfecting means maturing. See, uh, a Christian believer is supposed to have a mission. Um, you know what happens when people get saved? They think they've got it all whooped. I got saved in that church. When? 400 years ago. What are you doing still there? <laughs> Some people think once they get saved, they've done all they need to do. Can I go there? The bottom line of it is, no. You're supposed to, uh, if you are truly a believer, you're supposed to get to work. You're supposed to start saying, how can I help further the ministry um, with the mission? See, perfecting means maturing, as he spoke of in 11, 12. See, the gift of the Lord to the church are to bring us maturity. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, listen. The apostles and the prophets... All right, what they did, what? Through their writings. That's inspired writings of the Word of God. Evangelists, through their special ministry of, of reaching out. Pastors and teachers, foremost, above all, have the primary responsibility in bringing about Christian growth. So, see, you got to understand something. As believers, um, we, we've got a responsibility to do. Now, see, but here's the problem where I just mentioned how pastors and teachers have the primary responsibility in bringing about Christian growth. Well, you know, that doesn't let the parents off the hook. That doesn't, um, it doesn't fall on the school to teach children. That's the parent's job. And if we claim to be Christians, let me tell you what we should be doing. And if you get mad, don't walk out now because we'll know who you are. But the bottom line of it is, your job as a Christian is to grow, and you can't grow in the church till you grow in your home. Amen. I'll be, you know, it tickles me with the daycare system, and, and they'll have days off at the daycare. Um, the parents will be off for a legal holiday, but they carry the kids to the daycare because they can't deal with them. Yeah. 
I said, I asked, I asked John, I said, she said, yeah, it's a legal holiday. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, the school's out, or you know, the parents is off for this holiday, but we got to work. Why? Well, because they're going to all bring their kids. They get a break. And you wonder why our children are in the shape that they're in? You know, honestly, folks, I was raised in a, a whole different era of life. Let me tell you, when you were off, <laughs> you were home doing something. And I guarantee you, it won't complain and going. <laughs> I had my granddaughter with me, and she's spending out with me, so I could talk to her a little bit. I, I'm her counselor as well. But I was amazed. <laughs> you know, and, and see, we, we've missed the mark. If we've matured, we really need to back up and see what mature means as Christians. Because if that's the case, do you know it is, it's documented now that, believe it or not, uh, suicide, teenage suicide has overcome anything else going on to teenagers? Do you know um, we call preteens 13 and 14? Is that about right? Is that right? You know preteens and most of your preteens and, and, some, and most of your schools have tried pot? Do you know that um, sexually active? No, not in this county. Do you know you can't blame the school? And I know right, you say, well, where is it going with it? You have to blame the immature Christian walk. And we need to understand this, and, and I, I hope... I hope everybody's listening. That's uh, uh, that's that's compromising so that they so that they can um, have a, a friendship with their children. Listen carefully. You're not their friend. You're their parents. You you're their leadership. You you're you're the ones that's supposed to um, um, teaching them how to grow and how to mature. You're supposed to be teaching them uh, how to perfect them, and you can't perfect them if you haven't perfected yourself. And see, we need to understand as a church, when we mature, we want, we want God to bless this church. But I, I, I got news for you. You know, uh, the pastor and teacher, is, he, they're not supposed to be doing this. See, here's how the mistake, uh, this is a mistake we see in understanding the pastoral role. And, 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 and the pastor has become the one who does most of the, 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 the pastoring and the ministering work of the ministry instead of maturing others to do so. You know, people got to be willing to learn. Honestly, can I say this, guys, without offending nobody? You know, we should all, it, the, every time the door is open, you should be here. Unle unless you can't. I, I love what somebody said. They were hurting so bad, they said, I'm going to get here if I have to crawl. Because why? Because that's how you mature. Can you imagine if you told the children? Can you imagine if you said, told your children, said, look, you can go to school if you want to. And if you don't want to go, you don't have to. Can I get an honest kid that would sit here and say, well, I wouldn't go to school. If they'd have told me when I was a kid, well, you got an option. You can go to school or just stay home. I'm going to tell you, I'd never made it through first grade. Thank you, brother. I would not have made it through the first grade because I'd have never went to school. But see, guess what? You have to go to school so you can mature. See, that's the part you didn't want like here. So you got to go to school because you got mature. And parents is going to say, you've got to go to school. Well, I failed this grade. Well, you're going to get it right sooner or later. But you've got, to, in order to mature, you've got to learn. You've got to grow. So it's the same way with God. We take maturing in God as an option. Well, I ain't got to go. I ain't got to do this. I ain't got to do this. But see, there's the bottom line. That's a lie from Satan because as a Christian, you've got to. You've got to so that we can, we can grow. See, instead of being participants, Christians have become spectators. Honestly, I can tell you some of the largest churches I know of, people are all about, I'm, I'm just going to watch. I just want to watch. What are you watching for? <laughs> what are you looking for? You know, you're supposed to be maturing so that, so that we can go out and, 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 and reach people in need, so that we can go out and do something. See, it's, uh, some of your large, some of the churches now, and I'm, I'm not beating up the church, I'm talking about Christians in general. Pastors perform, 
on a Sunday or a Wednesday and their people go home and talk about it. That's, that's the way. See, and that's not maturity. See, too many believers feel their responsibility ends by paying the pastor or supporting missionaries. I've done my part. No, you haven't. Because when you stand before the Lord, he's going to say, what did you do for me? And, and, and listen, you know why we need to mature? The, the, the church needs to mature because whenever you look on the news and the occult, the occultic and the satanic churches are, and they call them churches, are now, uh, since an elective is at the colleges, I know because I've got a granddaughter doing it, they have an elective at the larger colleges now. It's called a Christian elective. After, after your regular school hours, you can go into praise and worship. You can have youth meetings and youth stuff. But since that now, the occultics and satanic have said, okay, they get to do it. We're going to start our satanic classes. So now that your major colleges, look it up and prove me wrong. The these colleges now are saying, well, we've got to let satanic worship take place if we allow Christian worship. And guess what? If we haven't taught our kids, they're going to get sucked up into that because the Bible says even the elect will be deceived. See, and, 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 and Satan is very decisive in deceiving people. Oh, come on over here. They only got... They, they only got drinks and chips. We got steaks, pork chop. We got the whole buffet over here. And that's the way Satan works. And, and, and if we're not mature, we move, lose the mark. I talked to someone today. And, 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 and let me tell you how, we, how we're being deceived. Um, one of their family members, I'm just going to leave it generic, has a... Uh, and it's a she, and she is um, she has come out and said that she's a lesbian, and that um, the Christian family is accepting this, and saying, "Well, I said, what 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 are you going to do? Well, there's nothing we can do, so they're going to get married." I'm telling you, but see, you seen where we have compromised. And, and we have set back, and we have, we have not matured, because if there was any maturity in that family, some of that would have took place. you got to teach them. See, it's, you know, it's, it's something you got to teach them. you got to teach them. You teach your child lying is wrong. How many of you know if your child lies to you, you tear him? He's behind up. I started saying something else. You tear is behind up, right? Come on. Come on. How, how many of you raised up if you told a lie, you got tore up? Go pick your weapon. Oh, go pick your switch. My weapon, your switch. And you went and got it, and they wore you out. And Mama always had a way of holding on to you. No matter how many circles you run, you couldn't get away from that grip. And, but yet, and look, and then, oh, how many of you remember stealing? Did you ever steal something? Well, we had a country store one time, Marvin Hardison's. Of course, I'm glad they're on, going on to be with Jesus now, but... Boy, if they turned their heads, we would go back there. They had a little thing behind the store where they sold bottles. You remember we used to get a nickel for the bottles, return bottles? Well, what we'd do, we'd go out there while Marvin won't look in and grab some of his bottles and come back in the front door with them. <laughs> Buy us a Bay Ruth about that long. Anybody remember them Butterfingers and Bay Ruth? Come on. I'm telling you, three people could eat that thing, boy. And I got caught. And I'm going to tell you, it had been better if I'd have shot the neighbor's hog in the head. Because they beat, the, look, they beat that stealing out of you, boy. And, and guess what? And, but here's the deal. We teach them not to lie, cheat, and steal. Not, and how to respect. But, but yet, and so they'll mature and say, well, this is wrong. And this is wrong. And this is wrong. But now we've come to the point where we're saying, oh, this is not wrong. This is not wrong. And, and, and then we wonder why they went their way. They went their way because we made this statement. Well, I want them to have every advantage that I didn't have. I, I cringe when I hear people say that. That can be a good thing, but it can be a bad thing. Because, see, we as maturing Christians, we need to understand that, that um, we have a responsibility. We have a, a mature believers uh, 
is supposed to see their mission in life as doing the work of the ministry. And that includes your house and your home. Reaching out to others with the love and, of the gospel of, uh, of Jesus. We're supposed to share Jesus. I had one of my granddaughters and I told her, I said, look, let me tell you why you're going through what you're going through. I said, because see, and, and if I'm mature enough, I'm supposed to teach her. I said, your problem is because, see, you, you're feeling empty because of what you're going through. You, you're feeling sad because after you've done this, you're more emptier than you were before. I said, because, see, you're not doing it the way Jesus wants you to. Jesus will never leave you empty and sad and depressed. And, and, and even the counselor said this, said, um, what is it you love about yourself? That was a simple question. And she started naming off a bunch of things. She said, stop. You're telling me what everybody else loves about you. She said, what do you love about you? She broke down and started crying. Just bust out in tears because she got to thinking, what do I love about me? She couldn't find nothing. You know what I told her? I said, you got to know Jesus. I said, you, I said, it, you're a Christian. She says, yes. I said, so let me tell you what you should love about you, that Jesus loves you. You should love that he's never going to forsake you. He will forgive you. And when you turn to him, he'll always be there. You should love when, when that next time that counselor asks you, what do you love about you? You need to say, I love that Jesus is in me. But see, we're not teaching, we're not teaching that. Because we want, we want to find out, you know, if they sucked on a pacifier when they were a child. We want to find out, you know, the things that make irrelevant to them. And rather than tell them that the most important thing in Christian maturity is to tell them about Jesus so they can grow. See, the, uh, when we talk about recognizing Christian maturity tonight, see, the mature Christian is a builder of other believers. See, so many people... We've got to understand something. We need to lift each other up. The Bible even says for the edifying of the body of Christ. The edifying, we are, who's the body of Christ? All right. We're supposed to lift each other up. Okay? Some of us need be knocked out, but we still need to edify and lift each other up. How do we edify? Edify means to build up or to help along. Christ is the head of the church. Each believer is a member. And, and say, how, do, how can we build each other up? We can care for uh, each other, uh, parts of the body. Remember we read in Scripture about the arm, and, and every part has a different uh, length, but it's all for one body. Um, that means we need to pray for each other. Let me tell you something. When It's just like in summer. She might even be pray. I pray she's listening. When, she, when they called me from another church because they knew that I knew her and she had told them about me, I called her. Do you know what I did? I didn't say, well, I'll be praying. I said, Summer, let's pray right now. See, let me tell you something. How many times have you said, I'll be praying for you? How about do it? She was, I got in touch with her and then I called her before she went in surgery and she sounded really, really down. I said, Summer, you're going you're gonna to be okay. Oh, I hope so. I said, no, Summer. I said, I want you to repeat after me. You are going to be fine. God's going to take care of you. The why, why, why did I want to pray with her? It's because we're supposed to be edifying. We're supposed to be lifting each other up. Look, listen. People say, well, I lift up Christians. Yeah, you lift up the ones that's already lifting up. You need to lift up those that's in the ditch. We need to lift up those that's down in the mess. I, I know they probably put themselves there, but we need to, to lift them up. Tell them about Jesus. I know that um, some of my family is really messed up in circumstances that I have to counsel them with, but you know what? You, you can only beat a dead horse but so long. You ever heard that old expression? Okay, what do I mean by that? Look, my granddaughter knows that she's messed up. Guess what? She's heard it so much, she knows it by heart. Now what do you do? You edify them. You lift them up. You say, look, I, I, you messed up. You're the only one in the world that messed up, but you, but you messed up. I never did anything like that. I was a saint. I don't know where you come from, but you sure ain't come from my bloodline. I don't tell none of mine that. I'm going to say, look, hey, I'm going to go on and tell you, you've done nothing compared to what I, I said. Let me go on and tell you. And, and I love what my granddaughter said. She said, Papa. She said, you know what I love about you? She said, <laughs> I don't know whether this is a good or bad thing. She said, but you come from the darkest place, and you come to the light of Jesus. 
I said, Amen. So I said, let me tell you about where you're at. The same Jesus that brought me out of mine is the same Jesus that's going to bring you out of yours. I said, so, yes, you messed up. Okay, he says, repent. Ask forgiveness. It's, it's gone. He never took, it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. I said, so, Nate, see, quit, quit getting guidance counselors. Quit, quit letting everybody hash it up. It's gone. Move forward. Lift them up and, and, and let them know. Say, okay, look, you messed up. Now let me show you how not to go there. I always, instead of criticizing a lot of people, I tell them, say, look, what, tell me what happened uh, what have you learned from this? Well, good. If you've learned that, I don't need to go no further. Now, let me tell you about what Jesus wants to do with you right now. That's called lifting up each other. It's called building a body of Christ. Because, see, I found out one thing. Nobody has ever left a church because they were being edified too much. I believe I'm going to leave that church. They're just too daggone nice. I ain't never met a bunch of nice people in my life. I can't stand it. Of course, hang on, that might happen. But the thing about it of it is, is people leave because why? It's because, see, we don't edify the body. Look, unfortunately, you know, there are some parts of the body that, 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 that aren't too good. Okay? All right? There are some parts of the body. It's like some of us might be the hands. But, see, there might be some parts of the body might be the toenails. Just want to clip them and move on. <laughs> But they're still the body of Christ. And so it, it, we have to handle each thing different, but we need to edify it up with the same thing, which is Jesus. And, and, and that's what builds the church. Pray for those. Look, look don't, when you pray, pray. Look, visit those that, that are in need, the widows and those at the nursing homes and stuff. Let me tell you something. That's God's word. You can also care for those that's physical needs of the body. You know, Paul, he did that in, um, in Jerusalem. He talked to the saints. He offered up to help them physically. See, you know, some people need physical help. You might, ha you might can see somebody that's in a need. I mean, you, you, it might be the smallest thing you do. But that's how we edify people, by doing things to help those in, in need. How about be a peacemaker? Anybody know what a peacemaker is? If you're a teacher, you can definitely know what a peacemaker is. If you're a preacher, you've got a master's degree. <laughs> and I've, so far, I've, I've flunked a lot. But be a peacemaker. That means it's just like in, in, in my family. I have to come in the middle. You know, it, it's hard to come in the middle of situations sometimes when, and be the peacemaker when, you know, you, you really want to just tell people how you feel. Anybody ever just want this? Let me tell you what I'm thinking. But see, you know, you can't be a peacemaker by just going off on both of them. You had to say, look, see, I've even told my own family, I said, y'all don't know Jesus, do you? I, they, and in fact, they said, something's different. And, she, and, and even Joan says, well, Greg's not like that. I said, they said, why? I said, because I got Jesus. If y'all had him, we wouldn't be in the middle of this mess we're in right now. And, and see, a peacemaker is someone that sees that, you know, if two people are arguing, <laughs> let me tell you something. The last thing you need is number three. Amen. I'm going to tell you, you know, you're like, okay, back off. <laughs> go get in your corner. You go get in your corner. And, and, um, and, and see, we're supposed to be peacemakers when circumstances is going wrong. Most of the time, you know, one of the two is wrong, if not both of them is wrong. But it's up to us to say, you know what? What would, I, I told them today, I said, what would Jesus do in this? And then they get real quiet. I said, do you think Jesus would be talking like this right now? You really think Jesus would do this? Of course, then they always throw up the old thing. Well, he cleared the temple. He threw them all out of the temple. I said, no, he didn't. He just threw the money changers. He got the, he got the, the world out of the mess. I said, no. I said, no, don't, don't even try that. I said, I know where you're going with this. I said, Jesus kept his he, he kept quiet in fact whenever he was being persecuted he kept quiet he just let who he was who he is shine in their circumstances and sometimes being a peacemaker means just by saying hey look and i and i tell people this all the time if you look at an argument you come to the wrong place sometimes i'm part of the problem <laughs> y'all ain't like that because see y'all are mature christians 
You need to ask a question. We, we need to ask that question if we want to mature. We need, and here's the question. Are others stronger in Christ because of you? Why don't you think about that question. Are others stronger in Christ because of you? Or maybe uh, are we the part of the problem rather than solution? Is the body more unified because of you? Now, I hope every church in the world is listening. I don't care where they are. Is, is your church unified because of you? Or is it split because of you? And there's probably a lot of people saying, well, I didn't have nothing to do with that split. Just because I walked that, the other 30 didn't have to come with me. Look, it only takes one person. One person to come in, and, 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 and I, I noticed it, you know, and, and, and cause a split or, or cause um, people to be um, split up and not unified. And, and, and the thing about it is, is see, I, I, I've learned this, you know, that if people, if, if one person has an attitude, it will just tear up a whole church. And I've never met a church that uh, split up. Oh, it took one person. And when a church is not unified, that's why the Bible said earlier, did they not say doctrine, every whim and doctrine? Tell me if I'm wrong. Okay, what does that mean? Every whim, everything in the wind. Look, I, I, I go by churches sometimes. I just try to figure out their names. <laughs> United Methodist, original, free will, Baptist, non, this. And I'm going, <laughs> what exactly is that? And I found out that they started out as one, they split, and then they started another one and took on another name. Then they split from that and, and took on another name and kept that another two. I'm like, goodness gracious, I do reckon. Does that Bible not say about that every whim of doctrine? Look, can I ask somebody a question? Was Jesus Baptist? I know he was Pentecostal, a little Presbyterian, holiness. No, he was Jesus. He was the Word of God. Word, and, and, and people need, if they don't take but this one scripture and go back to it, people need to quit saying, well, what's the name of your church? What do y'all believe? I mean, if you've got to ask the church what they believe, you've got a problem. How about go back to, hey, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Word of God. You know, doctrine, the Word. What's, what, what's your bylaws? The Word. What do you believe in? The Word. What's your articles of faith? The Word. What do you, what do you teach? The Word. I mean, but look. Every day somebody's coming up with a new name. And they call it a doctrine. I've had people tell me, and I hope they're listening. I went to do a revival at one, and they said, we don't do altar calls. I said, well, what's the use of me doing a revival? I told him, I said, look, the people in the graveyard beside the church are more alive than you are. Why do I want to do a revival? I believe I'd go stand at the cemetery. I might have a chance of somebody rising than I would if I can't have an altar call. Can you believe someone actually said, we don't do altar calls? I've had people tell me in, in revivals, and, and look, folks. I am not prejudiced. Let me tell you something. I've been in black churches, white churches, Hispanic churches. I've been, look, because God has always put me somewhere. You know why? It's because I don't believe in that stupid mess. I believe if you preach the word of God, people get saved, people get healed. That's all it's all about. I, I have people tell me, say, look, um, uh, here's what we do before you start preaching. Um, we want you to preach on this. I said, you're kidding, right? I actually give one church back. They tried to pay me. I actually give the money back. I was like, you know, and you know what? It was for a good reason. It was, it, 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 you know, I know we classify black, white, Hispanic. But it was, it was, a, it was a black church. But they had, I, 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 the reason I give them back the money, I'm going to tell you. Because when I went in that door, they had, I, I, I just got so, it, it tickled me. There was probably about 30 women on the front row. And, and they praised the Lord. Now I'm going to go on and tell you. Everything I did, it was amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. I, look, I had such an amen corner. I was so excited. I don't care what, I don't know what went on the rest of the church. But all I was, I, I was so tickled at, at the Holy Spirit that was in, in the church. I said, here, take your money back. I said, I don't even want your money. I said, take it back. I said, because, see, 
I went to church, and we had church. See, the, see, if we're mature Christians, we'll put down that other mess. The praise team, I'm going I'm to tell you about The praise team shouldn't be trying to jack everybody up. Shouldn't be begging you to smile, to grin, to praise the Lord. You know, mature Christians is all about, and this is what blows my mind, we're seasoned. You give me a church full of believers that are excited for Jesus, but listen, give them 30 years and they all sit there going. They got somebody new up there. Oh, Lord. I hope they don't get out of line. Oh, Lord. I hope they don't move too much one day. Praise the Lord. I just kind of hope they don't mess up what we got going. But you, but you get some of them new Christians. And here's what blows my mind. The immature Christian... Well, praise the Lord. All right, somebody stick with you. The mature Christian stops. Now, somebody just help me with this. I thought if you mature to something, that means you grow. Our mature Christians should show our young Christians how it's done. <laughs> praise the Lord. But has anybody ever thought about this? We have a mature we have a mature service. I, I didn't figure that. I said, no, you have a service where nobody don't want to move, breathe, or eat. We have this service. And I, I got all over a minister, and I, I, I'm sorry for doing so. Well, we have this service. It's called contemporary. We have one that's called traditional, and we have one for seniors. I'm like, I said, I can tell you what happened. The newest Christians are excited the mature Christians or, or the, uh, the traditional ones, they're more calmer. And those seniors, are, they're mature, and they know how to act in church. So <laughs> they get it over in 30 minutes. The middle one, they might go 45 minutes, but that first one, we got to give them all morning because they allow to praise God for about an hour and a half. I said, y'all got this backwards. He said, what do you mean? I said, y'all were supposed to be the seasoned, mature Christian. You're supposed to be showing them up, not them showing you up. That's what blows my mind. That's why I, I, I like the praise team. Say, no, they're, they're not all teenagers. It doesn't matter your age or your flesh. If you got Jesus and you got the Holy Spirit in you, if you matured, you're supposed to be the most exciting thing up here, even if you have to get up here with a cane. Claude, even if you got to come up here, thank you, Jesus. Praise the glory to God. See, there's our problem. We matured, but in the wrong way. Look, somebody got this messed up. God needs to let us know maturity does not mean rest home. It means you show people what's, how it's done. I'm not going to let no young preacher show me up. I'm going to shout him down. Just because my hair left don't mean Jesus did. And we're mature. I'm a mature Christian. Next time I tell you that, say, look, let me tell you what I am. I am a Christian that I have grown so much that I'm just a baby. I'm excited. See, and, uh, and next time somebody says, well, we've been in the church a long time. I, I, I actually know a church right now that the seniors left the church and give it to the youth in Kinston. I said, why? Well, they kind of took over. I'm going to say it. Stoned me. You mean to tell me seasoned, mature Christians... Let all these new people come in and show you up. You ought to be slapped. Because what does it mean to mature? Can you imagine my brother there getting through high school and not knowing nothing more than what he got in first grade? Where is he going from there? Back to the first grade. Not in her house, but somewhere. 
as teachers, we teach them so they can move forward. As Christians, we're supposed to mature so that we can do what? Move forward. Look, let me tell you something. It's, it's not a bad thing to, to um, look, my granddaughter can tell you, and, and wherever we went to eat, whether it was last night or this morning, I, I, I don't care if there's 10,000 heathens and demons sitting around us cussing up a storm. Give me your hands. We're going to pray. And you know what? Because if I'm a mature Christian, I'm not going to care about that enemy out there. I'm going to show maturity in my Christian walk. I'm not going to be ashamed. Last but not least, so I can shut this down, the mature Christian has a Bible base for every believe, belief. Listen, a mature Christian doesn't cuss somebody out because they say something they don't like. They say, let me tell you what God says. A mature Christian knows what he's talking about. No more children tossed to and fro. No longer snared or attracted to occultic teachings. Uh, solid in the Bible. Solid in, see, do you know why you believe what you believe? See, as a mature Christian, and I'm going to say this to you. And I, I'm going to go back because i got my young man in here. Here's the bottom line. If he's given an assignment to do, and the teacher says, okay, you've got to read this chapter in this book, and we're going to do a test on it. If he don't read it, he's going to get a big F. I don't know what to give him now, zeros, who knows. But whatever they give him, he's going to fail. Now listen closely. As a mature Christian, if we're supposed to mature, we're supposed to have knowledge of the Word of God so that whenever Satan comes at us and he uses people to come at you, that you are mature enough to say, well, I'm going to tell you what God said instead of what you think. Mature Christians have more knowledge of God than they do of the world. And whenever you do that, see, then you get solid. Then you get more mature. And just because you got knowledge, knowledge, knowledge is power. I love that because knowledge is power. That means whenever the praise team, I'm thinking about, I actually, since I have knowledge of the Word of God, I listen to what they're singing about God, and I'm thinking about the power of God and what they're doing. And look, and I'm not going to let, as old term, I'm not letting no young whippersnapper out do me. I'm going to praise God. I'm not, I don't care if someone, look, I watch people. They watch to see what, how the preacher does. Come on, church. I see you watching me. Well, don't watch me long. Because I'm going to praise the Lord. I don't care if i got people sitting back there going, well, he's not at his age. <laughs> we tell everybody how to act, and oh, well. Let me tell you something. No, uh -uh. a mature Christian is someone that's, that knows the Word of God and, and knows how to praise the Lord, and, and, and his heart is full of God. And they're the kinds of ones that a young person will look at and say, if you notice these kids come at you know why I'm attached to kids? Because, see, let me tell you something. They see maturity in your Christian walk. They want what you got. And if you don't got nothing, you can't give nothing. Maturity in the Word of God brings maturity in life. And in closing this, we need to examine ourselves for our, our maturity. Church, listen, if you want this church to continue to grow in maturity, we got to be the ones to mature. But we got to do it in a godly way. And, we, and, 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 you know, maturing is actually getting younger in Jesus. Because you're going to live for eternity. Eternity means 100 is not a number no more. Can you get me with this? So that means if, if what are you going to do in heaven? Bring me a wheelchair. I don't believe I can make it to see Jesus this morning. I don't believe we're going to make it. Do you mind carrying me to Jesus? No, sir, buddy. You're going to be, we're going to all be the same. We're going to all, no sickness, no illness, no disease. We're going we're gonna to be mature, but in a good way. And we're going to be praising the Lord, all of us. So why not do it here? Next time you go in the church that's dying, everybody says, well, we're all old, so that's your own fault. You're supposed to grow. And my point in closing, um, we need to set the example. Hey, I'm going to say this to you. Don't expect your children to sit there and get into something back there. When they see you get up here, 
and somebody has to punch you. Wake up. Come on. What are you mad about? You ain't smiled since you've been in church. Then you tell your child, get up there and, and shake your maracas. <laughs> Show them you love Jesus. And then you're sitting there and shut up. <laughs> Sit down and shut up. Yeah. We're supposed to be the mature ones. We're supposed <laughs> to be showing them how to praise the Lord and how it's done. Don't tell your grandchildren how it's done. Show them. Amen. Show them how it's Amen. done. So I expect you, when, if you do come back Sunday, yes, don't make this praise team have to throw bricks at you to get you to, to praise God. Come in and be excited because you've matured. See, God's looking down on us right now and say, well, they might get mature in the right way now. You want your joints to stop hurting so bad? Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I'm hushing now. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that your word is power. Your word is strength. Lord, and, and, and there's this message about maturing. Lord, if we mature in you, Lord, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and better every day. And help us to, to, to not get on the focus of maturity in the world but get our eyes on maturity in the word so that we can grow in knowledge and wisdom and understanding so that we can set an example that our children and grandchildren and all our youngs will say, wow, these folks are praising the Lord. Wow, these folks love Jesus. Listen, just because our flesh falters, our spirit never should. So I pray to revive our spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of us. So that, Lord, that we'll set an example that our kids say, I want to be like my daddy. I just pray that we'll set this supreme example that you set before us, Jesus. Put down the doctrines. Put down everything that don't line up with the Word of God. And lift up the Word of God in the way we live, the way we act, the way we talk, in every area of our life, Lord. And I pray as we close, Lord, I claim the blood of Jesus over those sicknesses, those that's in surgeries, those that's recovering, and those that are, are whatever their needs are tonight, homeless, hungry, drugs, alcohol, I don't care what it is. Right now, Lord, I just claim the blood of Jesus. My faith, no matter what size, locked into the Word of God is all we need. And we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.